Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live at uh, theCUBE. Exclusive coverage, Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of IBM Pulse live in Las Vegas. And we are here, uh, all the action, premier cloud show for IBM. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Ralph Rio, Research Director, Enterprise Software, ARC Advisory Group. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Um, so I got I to ask you, what's your take on the show? You know, if you look at the, from a, from a landscape perspective, how is IBM doing? Is it hanging together? Is the story hanging together? And uh, where, where, where did they get good grades and where they need to improve? Well, uh, the show is fantastic. There are, as you probably know already, 11,000 people here, which is a huge increase from previous years. Uh, I think the story IBM has around cloud and the new cloud stuff is fantastic. Uh, I happen to focus on enterprise asset management and IBM has had a great story around that with the Maximo and Trireger products. Uh, they had recently adding a great story around mobility. So I think IBM has a fantastic product line offer around enterprise asset management. So obviously cloud shows all the, is the, all the sex appeal, you know, cloud, mobile, big data, but they have smarter, the smarter enterprise, that's a big messaging for them. So, so under the hood, what is the asset management, the facilities guys, supply chains, all these guys out there who are working with IBM, what does this show mean? Because you know, this was a Tivoli show, systems management, a lot of data center stuff, so, so how does that stuff fit into the packaging here? Uh, is any, what new things are they announcing here that ties into the cloud, hybrid cloud expansion? Well, one thing they do is show their uh, product roadmap. So people who attend the show get an inside track on what is going to happen in the future with the uh, Maximo and Tivoli products and uh, smart infrastructure in general. So one thing is the inside track. Uh, another thing is that the products are very mature, but they still need new functions and new features, uh, and IBM's adding those, so when you get to know the roadmap, you have a much better understanding of uh, where it's going in the future. So Ralph, talk about, um, so ARC Advisory Group is a, a rather large research firm focused on the manufacturing sector, yes. right? Your specialty is, is, as you said, asset management you know, software, right? Yep. So talk a little bit about ARC Advisory uh, Research Group and your customers. Oh, all right. Uh, ARC is a, uh, what they call a boutique analyst firm. Actually, we're a little on the small side. We only have about 80 uh, employees altogether. Uh, we're focused on industrial and manufacturing. So I would consider that, Ralph, boutique plus. I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. Many boutiques with four or five guys, right? Oh, I mean, all right, you know, okay. Yeah. That's pretty good, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's a mid-market boutique. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh, okay, it's not Gartner or IDC or Forrester, but it's, but you know, it's, it's, it's up there. It's, it's, it's yeah. substantial, yeah. so. So with our focus on manufacturing, and we, did, we go from the plant floor, sensors, PLCs, DCS systems, clear up to uh, ERP and uh, enterprise asset management, so with that focus on the applications, we have deep domain knowledge that our clients uh, like to learn about. And your clients are large global manufacturers and, and Yeah, like. so it goes from discrete industries, people like Boeing, all the way over to the continuous process industries, people like Dow and DuPont, and everything that you can imagine in between. So you serve primarily that, that uh, that, that buy side constituency, and I'm sure the sell side you know, participants yes. as well. But so, I wanted to ask you, what's going on in that space? What are you, what are your clients? What are the changes that that that, that are that are going on? Every industry is getting disrupted. I mean, obviously, your clients have had to deal with China now for a decade or, or more. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. China and India, a whole outsourcing trend. Mm -hmm. What are the big trends you're seeing at the end customer level? Uh, just a minor distraction. Most of the, uh, there isn't as much outsourcing as the politicians would make you believe. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the decline in uh, manufacturing employment in the U.S. over the past 30, 40 years, 90% uh, of it is due to automation. Mm -hmm. Only 10% of it is due to, auto, uh, to outsourcing. Now the politicians love to make that a big campaign stop, uh, but it, the truth of the matter, that is not a, a significant factor. In terms of now trends for the second part of your question, mm. sorry to go off on that no, tangent. That's good, that's a good point, <laughs> good clarification. Uh, the second part of your question, what's new in enterprise asset management? Uh, one big aspect is mobility. Uh, that, now what I'm talking about here is a mobile device in the hands of the technician where they can manage a work order while they're on the site doing the work. This uh, does provide some improvement in efficiency, 
But the big benefit is the data integrity. So when you got good data going into your EAM system, it's real time and accurate, then people have more confidence in it and they use it. Now the second big thing going on is, of course, SaaS. Uh, IBM at this conference just announced SaaS for Enterprise Asset Management for Maximo. And that is allowing smaller companies, and it's opening the market for smaller companies who, who may not be able to afford the IT infrastructure to be able to afford a, a robust EAM application like Maximo. And what about larger companies? Are, they, are you seeing a, a slow shift from the sort of CapEx intensive install the, the hardware and the software to that SaaS model, or is that really largely going to be focused on the small mid-enterprises? Well, nothing is black and white, but for the most part, the big companies have the financial resources so they can afford to the capex and to buy the equipment. Uh, we're seeing, for at least for now, the larger companies and the major applications uh, continuing to be, I'm talking Fortune 500 type companies, continuing to be on premise. Uh, now, there are other applications that uh, they, they're bringing on new that will go SaaS, of course. But the mainstream applications in the Fortune 500, for the most part, uh, are still on-premise. And is that because of the, the economic advantage of being on-premise, or is it you know, concerns over, over security, or is it also sort of competitive advantage and unique capabilities of the, the software customization that they're doing? Yeah, it's, it's more around uh, their cost of money is low enough so that they can afford to uh, buy the equipment and a, the SaaS business model isn't quite as attractive as a, a smaller company. Keep in mind, the larger companies already have an infrastructure of technical people who can provide security. It's the smaller companies who, who don't have that infrastructure uh, that the, the uh, having an on-premise application that's connected to the internet creates a lot of risks that they really don't have the resources to manage. So they are much more likely to go to SaaS. So, so does your research show or confirm that it is actually at, at some scale, I don't know, whatever that crossover yeah. point is, that it's actually more cost effective uh, and, and more secure uh, and probably more compliant uh, uh, to stay on premise? Uh, do you, do you, does your research bear that out or is it still too, sort of too early to tell? Again, there is no black and white here. Uh, for now, we see the larger companies staying with on-premise, Fortune 500, go below the fo Fortune 500 and there's greater and greater adoption of SaaS. For a lot of the reasons you mentioned, security, yeah. cost, you know, and I can't get the skills to do security right. That's the, that's the smaller guys going, but so yeah. what I'm trying to get to, Ralph, and, and, and again, we may not have an answer here, is, 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 it, is, it, is are the large companies holding on to their existing models because of you know, economics uh, slash security, is there a strong business case or is it more inertia? That's kind of the way things are done. It takes a long time to change. What's your gut feel there? Well, uh, it is part of it is inertia, but right now the economics aren't as strong mm -hmm. as it is for the smaller person. Let's talk about Internet of Things. That's something else oh, that yeah. obviously is happening. I mean, AT&T and IBM have, you know, you know, got together. Um, right. You're seeing GE push the industrial internet. Yeah. Big right. customer GE, big customer of, of IBM's, but all, in a yeah. way, the smarter planet and the industrial internet are sort of, you know, counterpoised and competitive, right? So, what do you what do you make of the Internet of Things? What does it What does it mean to you know your clients and your research? What does it show? Yeah. So when I talk about the Internet of Things, I'm going to focus about around asset management. So here we're talking about assets in a plant or assets out in the field. So take power gen, in a plant would be the generator, uh, power distribution would be the transformers and the breakers and all that stuff out in, in the field. Uh, those things uh, the, need high uptime. One of the key metrics of why people get EAM systems is the uptime. Uh, when equipment goes down, it has an impact on revenue. Uh, also, the, there's a, a lot of uh, material can get lost, so that uh, impacts profitability. So, just focusing for a moment on the uptime metric. What does the Internet of Things do? Well, it allows you to remotely monitor a, an asset and predict when it's going to fail so that you can take corrective action before it fails. 
Now that has a, a couple of huge ramifications. One is often a small component will fail and uh, if you don't do anything about it, it will cascade into a much bigger problem. Much like if uh, you run out of oil in your car, it's $20 worth of oil, if you don't take care of that, your engine's gonna seize and that's gonna turn into a $5,000 repair. So being able to anticipate failures has, number one, huge ramifications in terms of the cost of a repair, and number two, now you can plan the downtime rather than ugly, unplanned downtime. And when you plan the downtime, then it's uh, less likely to be a big repair and uh, you can schedule it so it doesn't impact revenue. So this anticipatory capability that you just described, uh, there's, a, there's I'm sure a number of dimensions of that. There's the interconnectivity, uh, there's, there's I'm sure some kind of mobile capability for uh, points of control and access and vis visibility on the systems. There's also you know, big data analytics. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts, and I'm sure I'm missing five or 10. There's a lot <laughs> of moving parts coming together. When you talk to your clients, uh, which you know, presumably a lot of engineers and the like, are there headwinds in terms of absorbing this stuff, or are they ready to, to jump in? What's your sense? Yeah, the, the uh, primary headwind we've seen uh, for manufacturers is the security question. Uh, often IT will become very concerned if an outside company has access to, through the firewall, to the equipment inside the facility. So uh, that seems to be the major headwind. Okay, so um, so it's it's a belief that a connected world is inherently less secure, which is probably true. Right? Well, l <laughs> let me go in a little bit more detail because this varies by industry. If we were to talk about semiconductor, mm. they've been doing this for five or ten years, where the supplier monitors the equipment because it's very complex equipment. They call it tools in that industry, and they can go from the cheap one is ten million to five hundred million dollars and they're very complex, so the supplier monitors it and they send in te technicians to repairs. So this has been going on in semiconductor for a long time. It's, depending on the industry, it migrates in. Uh, what I was talking about, the resistance to, because of security, IT, uh, I see that in food and beverage accounts, which are more constrained. They're very low, fairly low margin, constrained, and they may not have the IT resources to, to uh, address it right now. Mm. Let's talk about the, John and I always like to talk about the horses on the track, um, you know, sort of the competitive outlook. So who are some of the, the supply side competitors that, that you watch? I mean, obviously IBM, I mean, SAP's a big player, and, and you know, there, are, there are others. Lay out sort of who you see as the sort of gold standard of the, we like to look at whales, barracudas, and minnows, you know, the, the whales out there, and are there any sort of you know, interesting mid-market companies that are emerging and any startups that you're tracking? Maybe share with us what you're finding there. Yeah, there's, uh, ARC tracks 160 companies in this space uh, as part of our market research. Uh, and there are a few leaders. And we could characterize the leaders, the top six or so, uh, in three camps. Either they're an independent best of breed like uh, IBM Maximo, uh, there are others that are part of a control system supplier, a DCS supplier, so they bring in a different attribute. And then uh, there are others that are part of the ERP application, like SAP. Mm -hmm. uh, and each account is different, and how they go about choosing and selecting uh, what's best for them varies quite so, a bit. So who are the guys we should be watching? Obviously IBM, uh, SAP, Oracle's got to play here as well? Or? Well, the, the it's IBM is the leader right now. Okay, so IBM's number share. one. Uh, it's in, number one. In terms of asset management. With uh, Maximo and yeah. Troyerica, yes. Okay. And then uh, we would follow by uh, a company called ABB, Ventex. The Ventex division recently did, past few years, did some acquisitions. So that is the example of the control system supply. Yeah, okay. They uh, supply DCS systems. Uh, and they now add uh, EAM is part of the reliability story. Uh, and then you have your uh, uh, ERP people, and that's both Oracle and SAP. They have their modules, add-on modules, to uh, their normal inventory management, et cetera. Do you track you know, the size of the market, even rough, in rough terms? I mean, oh, yeah. Look at that? So uh, that's, no, that's I, a big part of what in, you guys do? In so non-rough terms, how big very is this, precisely. So you guys kind of like the IDC of your space, if yes, you will, right? Yeah, okay, so yeah. you do a supply side you know, yes. look and a demand side, you yes. forecast yeah. out. So, so how, roughly how big of a market is it well, that, that you're globally, talking about? Well, globally, 
uh, it's roughly a $2 billion market. And uh, surprisingly, it's growing about, uh, I don't remember the exact number off my head, but it's, it's uh, larger than most software markets. It's in the order of 8 to 9%. Okay, so most software markets are probably going, what, 4 or 5%? Maybe? Well, if you're in yeah. ERP, it's around 5%. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so this is, it's, it's growing at twice the rate of the market. So the yes. Maximo piece, uh, which was an IBM acquisition, right? Yes. Is, um, is a part of the IBM strategy. IBM tries to find you know growth areas, bring them in, blue wash them, you yeah. know, yeah. and then and then off and running. So so that's a good move. Two billion dollar market growing at, at eight or nine percent a year, um, and 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 what kind of potential does it does it have here? Do you see it you know our, continuing our, that kind of growth? Yes, or? because the uh, if you look at the CEOs or executive suites metrics. Return on assets is a big metric for those people. And to manage that, you need an enterprise asset management system. And, a, and a one that's global. This yes. Gets more, yeah. you, know, more that, uh, you may ask the question, if I can, about w dynamics, what I see. You know, yeah, Do please. I see something a little interesting? Yeah. You know? So I talked about the big guys, you know, top six, eight. Uh, there is some dynamic behavior going on among some of the smaller, smaller suppliers. There's one that uh, uh, particularly attracts our attention. It's totally SaaS-based. It's called Dude Solutions. Dude? Dude. Like, <laughs> hey, dude? Yes, exactly like dude. So they have two applications, Facilities Dude and, and School Dude. And it's all SaaS, and they, with School Dude is the one that's really successful. And they focus in on uh, schools, basically high schools for the most part. And uh, so it's... Uh, targeted at that particular segment of the market. It is a market that was unserved, so they've been able to grow that, grow the market by entering that area and uh, with totally assess uh, solutions. Really, so they're tracking school assets, like what? Steam boilers and... Well, you know, yeah, it? you have that kind of stuff too, but you also have uh, things yeah, like... Equipment. Equipment. Yeah, computers. Uh, computers, and it goes on and on and on. It's, it's, particularly nowadays, there's a surprising lot of assets in your average school. Interesting. All right, Ralph, great stuff, really good analysis. You know, we love to go deep, John, with Dave the- loves to talk to the yeah. analysts. I'm not, I just sit here, just minding my own time. <laughs> um, my final question for you is, okay. uh, as an analyst, I mean, you see things come and go, and you, you know, I've, you've seen IBM make some moves. For the folks out there following IBM, they're seeing really some good vibe here. What is, what is, what is why is the vibe so positive, in your personal opinion? Well, uh, particularly at this conference, uh, a couple of dynamic se segment of the segments of the market, software market, are being addressed by IBM. You know, one is SaaS and, and, and cloud, very dynamic segment of the market. I mean, in the EAM space, along, among the smaller suppliers, we've seen over the past six years, uh, remember I said I tracked 160. We've seen about 60 drop out of the market because there are on-premise smaller suppliers. And we've seen about 50 new ones come on board with the SaaS business model. Now these are all smaller companies, but it's, a, it's a, just a data point on how dynamic this market is in terms of ado adopting SaaS and cloud. And IBM's right in the middle it's of it. It's table stakes now and you can't hang with the SaaS you're out, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And speed is key. Another thing, speed is just like the speed of value is, is another differentiator, so. Well, time to benefit is much quicker with a, with a cloud SaaS type approach. All right, Ralph, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We really appreciate it. This is Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of IBM Pulse, live in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. <laughs>